the actual uncensored story behind the origin of Kent Blake, Secret Service agent. The editors of this publication are proud to present the authenticated adventures of one of America's top secret agents, Kent Blake. These actual cases have never been revealed before and are based upon confidential records from the files of the Special Investigation Department in Washington, D.C. Each case has been personally checked and verified by Agent Kent Blake. For obvious reasons, the name Kent Blake is fictitious, as the use of his real name would endanger his mission and his life. But all other facts and incidents are accurate. All names and places in these true-to-life stories are fictitious. Any similarity between actual persons or places and those used in these stories is purely coincidental. So, let's take a tip from Agent Kent Blake, kids. Have you been trying to hold a solid wall, an invisible shield between reality on the one side and fantasy on the other? A lot of work, isn't it? Well, it's much more fun if you mix them all up like this. Well, that's a little better. to um, show you some of my favorite war comic books. Uh, war comics are interesting because they exist right there at that crossroads between reality and fantasy, that place where fantasy becomes very interesting uh, because it's based on realities that are really crazy. Now, um, the issue of realism comes up in war comic books all the time, uh, usually in the letters of, to the editor column. And in this one here, the guy who created Sergeant Rock says, as I've repeated ad infinitum, and it's true, he's been repeating this ad infinitum, in my original conception of Rock and in all my scripts, I have made him and Easy Company as realistic as humanly possible in this medium. So that's usually the, uh, what they say, is that these are really real stories, and the fans are always writing in to talk about how great it is to have these real stories. But as the letter goes on to explain, when they say that these comic books are very realistic. What they're really doing is comparing them to other comic books. So um, with Sergeant Rock, who's a really popular long-running title, I picked up this issue uh, this week. It's issue number 404. Uh, the way that you can tell he's real and not a superhero is that when he gets captured by the Nazi major and put in a prisoner of war camp, uh, and he's got a cell with an open window that's hundreds and hundreds of feet up above the river, higher than the Golden Gate Bridge, a superhero would just fly out the window. But uh, since he's uh, Sergeant Rock, what he has to do is call, call back on his training, and his special training that enables him to jump out, uh, fall farther than the height of the Golden Gate Bridge, and land in the water without hurting himself after having been injured in various ways within the last two days. And if this was a superhero comic book, then the uh, supervillain would see him escape and hit him with a big blast of cosmic uh, energy. But instead, it's really realistic. So the Nazi major was expecting him to jump out of that window and dive all the way down the river and survive. And so he's waiting with a machine gun instead of a cosmic death ray down at the bottom here. 
So um, the com this comic is about World War II, which was 40 years ago, but that's still the big war. Now. A um, couple of years ago, I, I decided to count how many pages were devoted to which enemies for all of the comic books that were available on sale that month. And Nazi Germany was being fought on over half of the pages. And when you throw in the uh, fight against the Japanese during World War II, World War II was 63% of the pages of who they were fighting. Now, um, I checked all the comics I could find this week, the New War comics. And G.I. Joe is still fighting Cobra. That's over here. This represents one book, this with here. They're an imaginary international terrorist organization. And G.I. Joe is still tangling it up with them. But all the other comic books that I found this week, uh, everybody else that they were fighting was uh, Nazi Germany. Now, um, if there's the Future 2 comic book uh, with Sergeant Rock. And the, um, that really shows the difference between reality and fantasy also, because um, Sergeant Rock travels to the future, and he fights against giant robots, and he fights against flying saucers. But instead of it being a time machine, it was all a dream. And that's how realistic it is. Now, it wasn't until the Korean War, though, that we came to have American uh, comic war comics as we know them. That's when the genre of war comic books really took off and expanded. Korea is over here. This war was uh, from 1950 to 53. And um, one of the reasons why war comic books are so great is that it allows us to retell the story until we like the way that it comes out and that it makes good sense to us. So uh, when the uh, Reds were, you know, trumping up all these germ warfare charges against America. In Monty Hall uh, comics, you were able to see what the real story was. And uh, what the real story was, I'll, I'll read the conclusion of it, was, and so another thrilling exploit of the U.S. Navy's silent service comes to an end. Through its efforts, Major Martin, Monty, Tex, and Canarsie were able to destroy a communist lie. The major proved that the North Korean epidemic was not bubonic plague instituted by diabolical UN germ warfare, but intestinal disorder caused by the Red Troops' own carelessness and poor living conditions. So, much more satisfying. Uh, there's another story uh, in War Report Number 5, which decided that it was bubonic plague, but that that was what it was instead of UN germ warfare. So the argument is different, but the conclusion is the same. That uh, it was all fake charges, which it probably was. No more evidence than uh, we have about the Yellow Rain. So uh, there are also a couple of other themes in Korean War comics that I enjoy. Um, one of them is prisoner of war escapes. Every prisoner of war who's captured in an American Korean War comic escapes. And uh, another one is brainwashing. Um, in this comic I'm holding in my hand, Marines in Battle, number 11, you can see uh, the way that the brainwashing thing is usually handled. Here's this guy, Chung Chu, a captain in the Communist People's Army in Korea. But when he gets done trying to brainwash these tough Americans who are so patriotic and so firmly in command of what real freedom is, he comes over to our side. And um, sure, it could have happened. But in comic books, it happens over and over again. And um, in this, oh, I, this another germ warfare story underneath where it says atomic rocket assault. But in this uh, comic book here, Brainwash, it's been written about, talked about, preached about, but how is it done? What makes men turn against everything they believe in? Just what is this brainwash? And it's got a lot of realistic detail in it, it's, and especially when the same comic books include stories that are obviously intended to be taken as fact and stories that are obviously fiction with soldiers fighting against dinosaurs and flying saucers and things. Uh, just where, where you just trust what becomes as tricky as trying to find out what's real on television. So this one uh, here is just uh, full of all kinds of convincing details here. 
and you can see the um, guy saying, we have uh, now been studying for two months, so we begin the second phase to see what you have learned. Comrade Morse, what is the basic rottenness in imperialistic America? And the poor tortured guy says, the basic rottenness of America is the capitalist system. There is no real equality. And, um, and oh boy, it's, uh, the guy does know what he's saying. But uh, on the subject of brainwashing, there's uh, one of the sponsors who's been most reliable for uh, supporting comic books. They've been advertising regularly in just about every book for the last 30, 40 years, are the hypnotism people. So let's take a break for an infomercial. And the uh, word we're going to take the break for is hypnotism. Want the thrill of imposing your will over someone? Of making someone do exactly what you order? Try hypnotism. This amazing technique gives full personal satisfaction. You'll find it entertaining and gratifying. Do you realize the power that hypnotism will give you? With the magic power of hypnosis, you can hypnotize at a glance, make people obey your commands, strengthen your memory, develop a strong personality, overcome bad habits. A very concise, compact, handy little book on hypnotism. Sold for many years as a course on the subject at one dollar per copy. Real informative. This is a terrific buy. Limited quantity at this price. Act now. Only one dollar! Television repairman's accidental discovery makes anyone a hypnotist right away. Secret method uses ordinary TV set. No electronic knowledge needed. No prior hypnotic training needed. Send no money, just name and address. Pay postman $2.98 plus COD postage. How often have you wished that you could exert a magnetic power and influence over others? Get people to respond to your every commands. Win respect, admiration, and envy from both men and women. Well, dream no longer. It's all possible through the secret magnetic power of hypnotism. Develop your hidden hypnotic powers to control the minds and bodies of men and women. Learn to perform amazing feats and entertain at parties. Until recently, the process of hypnotic induction was largely based on trial and error methods, which succeeded mainly with subjects who were highly susceptible to hypnosis in the first place. Well, now, however, recent scientific research has developed entirely new methods that not only sure fire in their results, but quick and easy to achieve. Hold the hypnocoin in front of the person you want to hypnotize. Then gently vibrate the plastic lens. This sets the hypnotic pattern into a whirling motion, a motion that is so fascinating it captivates and rivets your subject's eyes to the hypnocoin. Now proceed to give your hypnotic suggestions and commands. Hypnotize at a glance. Make people obey your commands. Strengthen your memory and much, much more. In January 1962, American television watchers found out that we were at war in a place called Vietnam. Now, um, a few months after that, the first issue of Jungle War Stories came out, set in the jungles of Asia and Africa, and it has a feature on Vietnam at the beginning. But uh, people who had been following American war comics, uh, this didn't hit them out of the blue. The issues had already been explained to them about uh, the war in Vietnam through a series of comic books. Uh, I've got examples dating back to 1951. Uh, in Spy Cases number seven, uh, there was a story. In, uh, it asked, will World War III start here? And the arrow pointed to Hanoi. And the uh, Reds were plotting an assassination, which they hoped to pin on the United States as an excuse to declare war. And this was a true spy case from the files of Agent Bill Rand. Now, in this uh, little bit later, the same comic book, this one I hold in my hand, Spy Cases number 17, had a story, Crash Landing, where these um, Americans who were flying down to give supplies to the French uh, were tricked by the uh, Reds into landing in the north so that uh, they could hold their plane for ransom and get weapons. 
And um, I like the dialogue here. The woman, uh, Indo-Chinese woman who captures them is the leader of this guerrilla band. She says, we always win. You Americans don't understand that yet because the United States has never yet lost a war, but they have a surprise coming. And uh, this guy's name, who she's talking to, is Doug Grant. All these agents never have more than uh, two syllables for names. And he says, uh, sure, the surprise is that anyone thinks that uh, they can change that record. But considering the mad ideals of communism, I'm not surprised at anything you madmen think possible. So that's 1951. And uh, there's another comic book here, 1954. Again, Indochina. In this one, this pilot is. Uh, going to go to the hidden sacred city of Fujama, good Indo-Chinese sounding name, to pick up the uh, beautiful spy Mitsu Toy. And um, so he goes down there and, and gets Mitsu Toy. And uh, she's got all the valuable papers and gets in the airplane. And she kisses him goodbye. And she jumps out of the cockpit because she wants to go down and fight in the jungle some more. And it's a real romantic story from Fighting Air Force, number nine. Now, one of the uh, war comics that really stands on its own is, uh, are the war comics that were published by EC and edited by Harvey Kurtzman. And Harvey Kurtzman, when he said he wanted to do a realistic war comic, what that meant was that he was going to um, research everything in exhaustive detail. And it didn't make that much difference in sales at the time, but the difference is now they're reprinting his stuff in uh, collector's editions. And in 1955, he ran a story in uh, Two-Fisted Tales about Dien Bien Phu, the defeat of the uh, French. And it was told from the French point of view. And it begins, this war-blighted Indochina land is as much a part of France as the bloodied earth of Verdun itself. This is Dien Bien Phu. So for those, for those who, um, are interested. Yen Bien Phu is right about there, and Verdun is right about there. And this was the most liberal war comic book that's ever, well, I don't know about ever. It's one of the very uh, good ones. So, but after 1962, that's when we really get a whole flood of um, war comic books about Vietnam. Um, the Tales of the Green Beret. Uh, illustrated by Joe Kubert, is um, this was a series, and I, there was a movie, and the whole works. And um, the artist eventually, I read that he, um, the stuff got to be too propagandistic for him. He decided it was too much for him. But there, there were a bunch of these things that came out beginning in 1967, and uh, other series from that time are things like Guerrilla War comics. Jungle War Stories. Um, this one here is a little bit on, uh, here's a couple for younger readers, more on the Unreal side. Uh, there's Todd Holt Super Green Beret, which is about a kid whose brother dies and leaves him a magic beret. And uh, he, when he puts this on, he becomes a grown man and goes around the world to uh, fight against people. And it's, um, and it's about a, you know, it's filled with fantasies, anything there is. And so they break up the stories with true, um, true page features about people that won medals in uh, Vietnam. And this one here, Operation Vietnam, is a Magic Man story. And I uh, like this a lot. It's got uh, Mao Zedong in it, and it's uh, got all kinds of wacky stuff. It's got hypnosis. Uh, you, let's see, the force of my will shall hold your magic powerless under my control. Repeat after me, I am powerless. And she does, I am powerless. And it also has uh, one of my favorite themes, which is the superhero who catches the atomic bomb. And uh, because the Chinese, I guess, are the ones that are dropping the atomic bomb on the American fleet. Um, so moving more up to the present, the, um, one of the recent innovations in comics is that they um, decided to have mercenaries 
uh, soldiers of fortune who aren't fighting for any government, they're just in it for the money. And this idea was um, based on the Soldiers of Fortune magazine. And they, they've been doing this one since June 1982 with these characters. And my favorite mercenary story, because it's a tricky thing, because you're drawing these things and a lot of kids are reading these. And uh, you want to not, you know, if they're fighting for money, that makes it adventurous. But they also have to uh, be the good guys fighting on the side of good. So what they do here is uh, they're in Paris. And they're in a cafe reading a newspaper, and they see an ad, Mercenaries Wanted. So they go to Central America, and the surprise is that it turns out that uh, the people who placed the ad are these impoverished peasants living in a village who were so upset by the corrupt and brutal and dictatorial um, rule of the Colonel Furiosa and his band uh, that they decided that they couldn't stand for it. So naturally, they put an ad in the paper and they hired mercenaries. And they offered to pay with um, wedding rings and um, with a pig and a goat. My beloved granddaughter, Paloma Senor, she will be honored to be your wife. And so um, they don't take Paloma, but they have it out against Colonel Furiosa. And so another innovation recently, they finally came up with a formula for war comic that sells well because War comics uh, have always been, a, since the Korean War ended, it's been a very small genre. And uh, they've never sold very well. But they're you know, a small genre, but a tough genre. They come out every month. But they finally came up with this idea, G.I. Joe. And uh, what they do is they don't fight against the Nazis. They don't fight against uh, North Koreans. They just fight against totally imaginary international terrorist conspiracy network. And uh, but they go to real places, like here in this issue, they're in Afghanistan, because two days ago, a top secret Russian spycraft crash landed in the Hindu Kush mountain range of Afghanistan. The plane and pilot are now in the hands of the Afghani rebel hill tribesmen. So um, it's one way to learn geography. The map down here has got a lot of countries labeled on it. And the um, G.I. Joe uh, comics, the superheroes are uh, the machines. And the issue that's on sale this week, uh, they, uh, the part I liked was that the, um, they get into a bit of trouble. So the guy who's in command of the G.I. Joe's craft says, what we have to do is um, use a tactical nuclear weapon. And that causes a bit of consternation until somebody finally realizes what they can do instead, which is use conventional explosive weapon. And that solves the problem and gets you up to next week or next month, actually. It's a monthly comic book. And these are two other comic books that came out this week, The Losers and Lonely War of Captain Willie Schultz. So, and this is by Charlton. Charlton is um, the number one seller of war comics, but all of the war comics that they publish are um, reprints. And so, but when things, you know, get really grim and only the toughest survive, Shelton is out there fighting the Nazis month after month. And so um, since we're up to the present, that leaves us enough time to uh, zip back to the past a little bit. And I can show you some of my favorite comics from my collection. This one here has got the fantastic story of Mousy the Medic. It's uh, one of the many comic books which show conscientious objectors who um, go over to uh, get into combat because they're medics or for some reason. And then they decide that the enemy is really morally inferior and that, that they should be uh, fighting. And they do. And um, this one here is Brain Boy. And this is a bit of psychic warfare from the early 60s. And um, he uses, he, here he is flying through the air. And you can uh, follow his adventures. In this one, he goes down to Latin America, really wreaks havoc. War Report, here's another guy who, who just was a soft-hearted kid. You can see it says right there on the cover. But uh, he gets into battle and decides, uh, comes to a new realization about the nature of the world. 
uh, Steve Savage flight to kill it. Okay, um, there's a bunch of these. There's the revolt of the slave workers, and all of these have a, you know, different patent blend between reality and fantasy. From uh, here to this guy so happy and he's whipping everybody up. There's a um, letter in this Sergeant Rock, which I bought this week, which is also about uh, reality and fantasy. And the person who wrote in said, in retrospect, I guess the story can be viewed another way. It's showing how dream and reality drift into one another across their hazy borders in war. This, of course, viewed from the level of an individual soldier who is already involved in the unreality of war and thus susceptible to all sorts of shocks and delusions. Or are they? In some sense, whatever soldier believes is real and that it motivates him and guides him in his actions in the, quote, real, end quote, war. So my advice, if you're crossing those hazy borders, always use safety glass. And let's hope that in the future all wars are fought in comic books. Every time the good guys won, fire missile, bomb a knife. I don't know, I just love it. Oh, yeah.